This is Premier Aerodynamics podcast number 17, and we're talking about dragonfly flight today. And to do that, we're going to be looking at a paper called Phasing of Dragonfly Wings Can Improve Aerodynamic Efficiency by Removing Swell. This is open access, so you can find it online quite easily. The link is in the description, by the way. So dragonflies are quite different to a lot of other insects in that they have four wings instead of just two. And they this is the subject of a lot of uh, inquiry because while a lot of other insects they evolved to have these two dragonflies have remained uh, having four interestingly as well is that dragonfly are also among the fastest of the insects and the most agile they hunt other insects so they are very unique that way so this paper goes on and in the abstract it says dragonflies are dramatic successful aerial predators notable for their fly agility and endurance Further, they are highly capable of low speed hovering and even backwards flight. So that's one thing that is quite unique, them being able to fly backwards. While insects have repeatedly modified or reduced one pair of wings or mechanically coupled their fore and hind wings, dragonflies and damselflies have maintained their distinctive independently controllable four winged form for over 300 million years. Here we demonstrate with a mechanical model, dragonfly that, Despite presenting no advantage in terms of lift, flying with two pairs of wings can be highly effective at improving aerodynamic efficiency. This is achieved by recovering energy from the wake wasted as swell in a manner analogous to coaxial contra-rotating helical rotors. With the appropriate fore hind wing phasing, aerodynamic power requirements can be reduced by up to 22% compared with a single pair of wings, indicating one advantage of four-winged flight that may, be, may apply to both Dragonflies and in the future, biomimetic micro air vehicles. So, what they're saying here is because there are effectively two sets of wings one at the front, one at the back, so fore and hind, the wake that's coming from the fore is actually being taken advantage of by the wake at the, the, of the uh, rear wings and the amount of power required to, uh, to produce lift then reduces. And that's how they're able to. Uh, fly so efficiently and effectively. So moving on in the introduction, they go on and say, dragonflies are capable of a diversity of flight te techniques, including effective gliding, powerful ascending flight, tandem flight during copulation, low speed maneuvering and hovering. In contrast to most other insects, direct musculature acts at each wing base, enabling dragonflies to control each wing independently. So the way that dragonfly wings work is you have their wings that are effectively connected to their abdomen and then in the abdomen it can um, expand and contract and that moves these wings independently so they can they can uh, move their wings very very quickly so they have a very high rate of um, of the, their um, flight of their flutter effectively and then that allows them to hover and even fly very quickly going on they say that Indeed, a wide range of phase relationships have been described between four and hind wings. So for example, what they mean by phase relationship is depending on where the wings are in their cycle of flapping, you can have the both the four and hind wings flapping down at the same time, or you can have the front ones flapping down a little bit before the ones behind or vice versa, or they can be completely out of sync. So when the ones at the front are completely flapped down at their lowest point, the hind ones are at their highest point. So they can be in and out, in sync or out of sync depending on the phase relationship. In many instances, dragonflies are also observed flying with fore and hind wings operating somewhat out of phase. Godnitsky postulated that anti-phase wing motions might benefit the hunting, either due to an increase in readiness for maneuverability or by reducing center of mass oscillations, both reducing visibility to potential prey and aiding location of targets. Previous computational and experimental studies on the consequences of fore and hind wing phasing have demonstrated that phasing can also have a bearing on both thrust production and power. However, variations in thrust and power are closely correlated, suggesting that certain phases could increase thrust production, albeit with an increased power requirement, very much as would be expected with control through varying other kinematics such as frequency or angle of attack. Slow visualizations around flapping dragonfly models demonstrate the potential for interaction between the forewing wakes and the hindwing, resulting in a 
range of possible consequences, including the fusing of border seas and possible lift enhancement. However, their implications in terms of power and efficiency are not clear. So for example, fusing of border seas would often occur if you have border seas of the same sign. So yeah, if you have one vortex of the same sign upstream and it comes down and impacts another vortex, let's say the tip vortices, then they can uh, go together, they can uh, have this compound effect, which then grows. If you have vortices on the opposite sign, then they will typically annihilate each other. So then you won't have any vortices of any vortices either. So in order for vortices to fuse uh, in, a, um, in a constructive way, then they have to have, be on the same sign. If they fuse in a, in a destructive way, then they're on the opposite sign. So moving on, visualization of smoke around free-flying dragonflies indicates the potential for a range of wing-wake interactions in forward flight. In this study, we use a mechanical model hovering dragonfly to revisit the efficiency implications of phase on hovering flap, on hovering with flapping tandem wings. So the model that they have here is not necessarily a particular dragonfly model. It's just two wings that a dragonfly like. So they want to see how moving them in um, sync or out of sync affects their lift production. And that then um, applies to dragonfly flight to some extent. So with their experimental details, they go in and they just say, we observed the effect of hovering with two pairs of wings by measuring the forces and wakes produced by an intermediate Reynolds number robotic hovering model dragonfly and demonstrate the significance of hovering with a range of four hind wing phases. Now the next part is quite interesting. They say the Reynolds numbers based on the mean wing cord wing tip velocity were 105 for the forewing and 125 for the hind wing. Now, this is at the low end for small hovering dragonflies, but it is considered well above the traditional Reynolds number. So these Reynolds numbers are very low by regular standards, 105 and 125. Yet they're considered above the transitional Reynolds number. Usually, like <laughs> you can have Reynolds numbers at 200,000 and they're still transitional, 500,000 is still transitional, but these are only 105, 125 and are considered above the transitional region. There are quite a few reasons that they uh, can be considered above the transitional Reynolds number. One of them is that a dragon's fly, dragonfly wing is not smooth. It's not like just a piece of uh, sheet paper or just a flat plate. It's more like if, let's say you grab a piece of paper and then you scrunch it in one direction, then you pull it out. Then you have like all these creases in there. That's effectively like a dragonfly wing. And the reason why dragonflies, their wings have been evolved to this, we think, is to reduce the tendency for laminar separation bubbles to form. By having all this roughness effectively, you can then bypass this laminar separation bubble phenomenon, and then that makes the flow over the wing more stable. Another reason why these two Reynolds numbers, 105 and 125, despite being incredibly low, can be considered above the transitional Reynolds number is because of the um, turbulent nature of the flow around it. So particularly the hind wings, you have a turbulent flow of upstream and in impacting it. So you're going to have likely a very turbulent flow, which is why we can consider such low Reynolds numbers to be above the transitional Reynolds numbers still, they're still turbulent. So moving on, the robotic model represents the two dynamically scaled right wings of a hovering dragonfly with realistic wing shapes and hinges vertically separated by 1.25 cord lengths, yielding four wings beating directly above the hind wings. Both fore and hind wings followed identical generalized kinematic sweeping a horizontal stroke plane. To provide a moderately realistic test bed with which the significance of wing phasing could be investigated without introducing profounding you know, factors such as the direction of the net force vector. So in other words, they just um, tried to make this test bed so that they could isolate certain aspects. So the aerodynamic efficiency is represented by the figure of merit. I've gone into this uh, in a previous podcast. If you look at podcast number 15, I talk about the figure of merit and how that applies to helicopters and um, rotating wing uh, aircraft. They also look at it here. Now, it's not that common to look at the figure of merit of non-rotating wing aircraft, but 
here they have some good reasons. For example, they have um, these this kind of cyclical fashion for flapping. So they look at the figure of merit, and it's a special case of propeller efficiency use of hovering helicopters. This term describes the ratio of the minimum theoretical power required for hovering to the measured aerodynamic power. In effect, the figure of merit expresses aerodynamic efficiency by comparing by comparison with the ideal helicopter. So dragonflies are not helicopters, so this is kind of um, an approximation. So moving on to the results in the discussion, interactions between fore and hind wings was largely detrimental in terms of lift, though some phases are less detrimental than others. So saying that they're largely detrimental, this is, um, we have to remember that this is a mechanical device, it's not an actual dragonfly. This is important to note because an actual dragonfly, we, uh, honestly speaking, we probably don't understand how regular dragonflies or really any insect truly flies. So we've made these, these machines to try to replicate them, but they're only as good as our understanding of how they fly to begin with. So there's this kind of chicken and the egg thing happening where we're trying to analyze how they fly. So we make a machine that we think we know how they fly to analyze how they fly. So <laughs> there's kind of this assumption that gets inbuilt. So whether this um, large detriment in terms of lift really occurs for actual dragonflies or not is up for discussion. But for this mechanical um, object, it definitely was. And some phases were less detrimental than others. The reduction in lift is attributable to a reduction in the angle of incidence between each wing and the local fluid. The wings produced a, an induced downward flow below below and above the level of the wings. Angles of incidence are reduced due to the forewings downwash on the hind wing and the hind wings inwash on the forewing. So there's this coupling now. So there's, there's obviously a downstream effect of the, the flow physics of the forewing impacting the hind wings. But then there's also this upstream of these, the flow physics of the hind wings impacting the forewing wings. In addition to the reduced lift and fore hind wing interaction, the mean lift to mean drag ratio of the flapping wings while varying with phase is in, not improved compared with wings operating in isolation. So what this is saying is that apparently for this mechanical device at least, the lift to drag ratio, which is one of the measures to determine how efficient a lifting surface is or a lifting platform is, is actually um, being negatively affected and it does um, apply, it does um, get affected by the phase. So certain phases are even worse than other phases. This means that if you have, let's say, um, one of the four wings are completely out of phase with the hind wings, you'll have a certain detriment. And then when they are somewhat in phase, the detriment will be slightly different. So it is thus tempting to conclude that aerodynamic efficiency would always be reduced when wings operate in tandem. However, we find that this is not the case. At advanced phases, the figure of merits are better than in isolated wings. So even though you have a reduced lift to drag ratio, the figure of merit is better. This shows you uh, just how us trying to apply the mathematical equations we have for our own flight that we've developed to other systems of flight may not be the case. We have certain numbers which we rely on indicating, no, they're not very good, but then other numbers saying, no, they're actually really good. So that indicates now that we don't understand exactly how they fly. So this is a good uh, tip for that. When you have that kind of thing happening, you need to step back and realize that uh, we're not really grasping the full understanding of how something is flying, at least due to, due to our um, mathematical understanding of flight to date. So moving on, aerodynamic efficiency of isolated wings is poor in all cases, consistently below half that of an ideal actuated disc or perfect helicopter approximately half of that calculated analytically without flow separation and considered considerably below values achieved by real helicopters. So again, we're using the numbers that we have for the system of flight that we have developed. That may not be the case for actual flight in nature. The figure of merits of isolated four or hind wings are surpassed by combining four and hind wings operating with positive wing phases. So a positive wing phase is where the hind wings are slightly ahead of the forewings in its flapping motion. So if the, let's say the, the 
four wings are at its highest point in the in the um, flap. The hind wings have already started its downward motion. So, to do, so four wing flight with correct four hind wing phasing improves aerodynamic efficiency. To determine aerodynamic power savings, we calculated the wing beat frequency required to achieve identical mean lifts for wings operating at different phases. From this, the power requirements for hovering were scaled and repaired. Hovering with a phase shift of plus 25% requires 16% less power than a phase shift of minus 25%. So this means is um, if the it's plus 25% phase shift means that the hind wings are about a quarter way through its um, flapping motion uh, ahead of the four wings, and you get a 16% less power um, requirement to produce the same amount of lift. So that's pretty good in, in the hovering phase. Although this comparison ignores other potential kinematic parameters, it shows that hovering with the correct phase between four and high wings can have a considerable en energetic significance. Similarly, a comparison can be made between two winged and four winged power requirements. Constraining wing shape and all aspects of kinematics apart from wing beat frequency, hovering with four wings at best phase shift requires 22% less power than hovering with only the four wings at the same mean lift production. So again, there are certain times when, for this machine at least, you can get a much more efficient hovering um, phase with these four wings, or at least two wings in these uh, phase shifts. The apparent paradox that efficiency can be improved despite a reduction, reduced ratio of mean lift to mean drag is explained by two different views describing the same physical phenomenon. The first is a shift in the timing of the forces. The periodic non-vertical components of the wake left by the forewing allow. At positive, hind wing leading phase shifts the hind wing to generate high aerodynamic forces when moving relatively slowly at the extremes of the stroke. So that's one reason. And they go on and say the significance of unsteady aerodynamic force development, that which cannot be predicted with a quasi-steady analysis relating aerodynamic forces to the square of the velocity. So this is what I was just talking about earlier, where they're saying that there's a significance of unsteady aerodynamic forces. And pretty much everything, almost every mathematical uh, equation that we have to describe a lift is quasi-steady. It's not dynamic. So that means that our equations will break down. And that tells us exactly that there's more to this than meets the eye. We don't really understand how dragonfly flight works and a lot of other flight works as well because our understanding doesn't apply it's completely different it's kind of comparing apples with oranges so that's one reason why um, there is this paradox the other reason is that the second description of this phenomenon is apparent from the resultant wake after the action of both sets of wings the term swell applies to lateral motions of the wake presenting representing non-downward and thus non-weight supporting momentum. This means that a swell is effectively just flow in a direction that does not produce lift. It doesn't support the weight of this object. It can be side force or drag, but it's not lift. So in terms of lift, this is effectively wasted energy. So energy put into swell is wasteful, as I said, as it is not associated with momentum flux providing weight support. At positive kinematic phases, High aer aerodynamic efficiencies, swell applied to the fluid by the forewings can be recovered at a, to a certain extent by the hindwings, re redirecting lateral motions of the weight into the verticals. So that's really cool. So they're using effectively kind of the weight that's being dumped into the energy that's being dumped into the wake to then produce lift for the hindwings. So they're kind of recuperating this energy. You can kind of look at it as. At an inefficient phase shift, so minus 25%, for example, the spreading wake has a considerable component of non-downward momentum. By contrast, at an efficient uh, 400 wing phase shift, so plus 25%, for example, the contracting wake is largely vertical. So this means this shows you how the wake has now been redirected in a certain way when you have a sort of phase shift. When you don't have a phase shift, this doesn't happen. And this is how you can take advantage of the wake from upstream. The stream tubes of the wake at the same instant 
and position to highlight the effectiveness of the plus 25 phase as it's producing a conventional converging momentum jet. So at a plus 25% phase shift, there's effectively this jet forming, which is producing uh, lift. Where you don't get that for the minus 25%. So there's this real um, delicate nature to have this phase shift. Flow speeds in the wake are also generally lower at plus 25% phase shift, suggesting that less kinetic, less kinetic energy is put into the wake for a given change in vertical momentum. So that's always good. When you have less kinetic energy, that almost always represents a more efficient flight. When you have more kinetic energy in the being dumped into the wake, that's that should um, trigger alarm bells that you're wasting energy. So the mechanism for improving efficiency by swell removal matches the energy extraction by the hind wing or the wake of the forewing predicted by Lamp, another author, another um, paper. And it's directly analogous to the exploited to that exploited by coaxial contra-rotating rotors exemplified by helicopters such as the Kamov Ka50. So then what they're saying here is, okay, um, there is a similar flow phenomenon going on between helicopters, heli contra-rotating helicopters, which is um, we have a helicopter with two rotors, one spinning in one direction, one spinning in the other. And obviously the weight from the, the upstream one, which is the one higher, is in uh, impacting the one below. And you're still gonna have this upstream effect as well. So in conclusion, the findings that the conditions for high lift are the same as those for high aerial efficiency raises the question of why dragonflies use such a diversity of kinematic phase shifts during free flight. Previous suggestions include varying requirements for thrust, efficiency and readiness for maneuverability and some other aspect of, of hunting performance. An alternative explanation for the observed phase shifts in free flight is that the appropriate wing phasing to make effective use of swirl removal is dependent on the speed with which the weight travels between the fore and hind wings. And this is determined by the fly speed direction and thrust production. So this, is, this makes a lot of sense. So they say that you have this phase shift of plus 25% between the front and hind wings. And this is so that the wake that is coming, this particular wake that's coming from the front wings has time to impact the rear wings and then the rear wings can uh, use it. Well, depending on the, the flight speed your, and the direction and the thrust reduction, the amount of time it takes for this wake to travel downstream and impact the hind wings is gonna be different. So at a certain velocity, you might have a phase shift of plus 25% is optimal. But when you go to a different velocity, that may be not optimal at all because the flow might have, the weight from upstream might have taken longer to get downstream or it might have gone very quickly. So then the phase shift might be different. And this is probably a good reason why um, dragonflies can control each of their wings independently. There are probably other reasons as well, but one of the main reasons would be that so they can change their phase shift and depending on the flight speed direction and thrust and still um, be very efficient at flying. So in this scenario, the plus 25% phase shift between both wings during hovering, between during hovering should decrease with increasing flight speed owing to the increase in wake velocity relative to the dragonfly, dragon to the, relative to the dragonfly, sorry. The range of observed phase shifts might therefore simply reflect kinematic requirements to achieve the same swell removing mechanism at the various flight conditions by ensuring that the hind wings meet the correct part of the falling wake. So that's what we were just mentioning there, where you need to wait for a certain period of time for the flow to get to the hind wing so you can use it. Suggesting an evolutionary advantage to either two wing or four winged forms is unwise, considering the success and diversity of the true flies, uh, dipteria. And yet the maintenance of the four winged form by dragonflies such as the carboniferous. So it may be unwise, maybe not. I mean, the fact of the matter is that dragonflies do fly much faster than almost any other insect. They hunt other insects, which means that they need to be more agile. So there is definitely a reason why they have four wings. And it may just be the fact that for their particular lifestyle, four wings is better than a two. Any energetic benefit from four winged flapping would be of great interest in the field of biomimetic aircraft design because flapping winged aircraft are challenged by the high power requirements of flapping flight. So again, uh, high, there's a 
a lot of power required for flapping flight, but that's largely because we don't understand it too well. I mean, uh, there is obviously a reason why a lot of uh, animals do have flapping flight and to think that they are very inefficient is probably unwise considering that they've had millions of years of evolution to perfect their flight. So it's probably just an indication that we don't really understand them too well. All right, so make sure to check out the Atmosphere Hawk and our other instruments we make here at Premier Aerodynamics. Uh, links in the description. Check out the courses we put on to make you a better aerodynamicist and check out the International Aerodynamics Conference we put on every year for aerodynamicists to get together and talk about what we love, aerodynamics. So make sure to like and subscribe to this and I'll see you in the next podcast. Peace out.